السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So, um, أخي أيمن sees me in this outfit. I've never dressed like this before. Someone gifted it to me from Melbourne and I promised them that I'm going to wear it here. So I come out, mashallah, and he says to me, Hello, Smurf. I said, if my beard was white, you'd call me Papa Smurf. Anyway, he's brushing off on me. How are you, fam? How's everyone? Alhamdulillah. Okay, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. I've got a beautiful topic for you. I want to talk to you about it. It's really close to my heart and I want to share it with you, inshallah. It's called talking to Allah. So basically about dua and connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But let's go through it, inshallah. First of all, the theme today is about the Qur'an. So I want to begin with a verse from the Qur'an about the Qur'an, insha'Allah, for us to start off and to be proud of why we're here, insha'Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in chapter 10, verse 58, A'udhu billahi min ash rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ya Ayyuhan Nasu Qad Jaatkum Maw'idhatum Min Rabbikum Wa Shifa'un Lima Fi Suduri Wa Hudan Wa Rahmatun Lil Mu'mineen قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون Allah says O oh people now has there come to you an exhortation from your Lord a healing for the ailments of the hearts and a guidance and mercy for those who believe. Tell them, O Prophet, let them rejoice in Allah's grace and mercy through which this book has come to you. It is better than all the riches that they accumulate. So rejoice, brothers and sisters, with this Qur'an, the word of Allah, which He talks to us through, and it is His relationship to us. He talks to us, and He is waiting for us to respond. Brothers and sisters, let me begin with something. From the moment we're born, every human being has a natural, psychological, innate nature. That nature, from the moment you're a baby, is that you yearn for an attachment with a caregiver, someone who looks after you, someone that you can feel the love from, someone that you can cry to as a baby. The person who will look after you in your vulnerability as a baby. And the psychologists say that when a baby attaches to its mother and to its father and there's a healthy relationship, that child grows up to have a better psychological well-being and a longer survival rate. Why? Because their mental well-being is better because they found their attachment to a caregiver. The human being loves to feel secure and safe. And in our times of hardship and when we feel lost, we naturally turn to someone. Some of us know who to turn to and others of us don't, so we feel lost. Some people don't have any support mechanism and others they do have the support, but when the going gets tough, even the closest people to them that they relied on, they can't help them. So we always yearn to look for something even higher. And if we can't find that this is how people go astray, they resort to all sorts of harmful things in their lives. They resort to drugs, they resort to sexual addictions, they resort to gang, gangs, they look for their identity or they just lose themselves. Some people even take their life. Psychologists tell us that based on this, they found, this is a, this is a, a study which is confirmed. They said that thus, a person who has a connection with God or a higher power, a faith in God, it is proven that they have a better psychological health overall. And their mental condition 
is better dealt with over time and they have less rates of suicide. So brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he call us to do? He says to you, connect with me so that you can feel amazing. The moment that you woke up in the morning and right now that you are breathing, the fact that you're breathing means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still has use for you in this world. And you have a purpose and an importance in this world. You are needed. Or someone needs you. Or Allah has seen something good in you that He wants your goodness to continue. Or He's giving you time to repent and to return. Whatever it is, assume well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll tell you a little short story. This happened to me a few years back. An atheist guy, an atheist who doesn't believe in God at all. He was a cable guy. He came to my house to do some cable technician, technical stuff. So after we finished, he liked me and he said, you know what, I'm going to do it for free for you. He was an American dude. So we came outside and had a little discussion. He wanted to talk to me. And he said to me, you know, I've looked through all the religions and I've given up on God. I don't want to see or talk about God. I said, have you looked at the Quran or Islam? I couldn't even finish the sentence. And he goes, no, I don't want to talk about God. No God. I went through so much pain. And then I said to him, just, and he said, no. So I stopped. And then he himself said to me, his worries and his pain and his trauma. And in the end, wallahi, he said to me this by himself. He said to me, but you know what? Why do I feel, why do I imagine that if I was, because I go fishing, he says, I imagine that if I was on the boat in the middle of the sea and I'm all alone, I get this thought, this fear, that what if my boat sunk right now and I got nobody to help me? I feel so scared. I feel so vulnerable. Why do I, he's asking me, why do I feel like I need to turn upwards? Like I need to call upon God? Why do I feel like that? And I'm, I'm thinking, you, you just shut me up. What, why are you asking me this question? But it's innate. We always look for a higher power. He says, why do I feel like that? He must have felt that there's something good and a bit deeper that I can offer him. I said to him, you know what? Remember when I told you about reading the Quran? He goes, no, I don't want to ask. Just please. I just want to tell you exactly about your question. And I recited to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Allah says in chapter 29 verse 65, And when they, the disbelievers of Mecca, talking about the disbelievers of Mecca, and to every other disbeliever, when they, the disbelievers of Mecca, embark in the ships, they call upon Allah. They call upon Allah with full heartedness, with their faith to Him. But when He rescues them and brings them to land, they suddenly begin to associate others with Allah in His divinity. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا غَشِيَهُمْ مَوْجٌ كَالظُّلَلِ دَعَوُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ فَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدُونَ وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلُّ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ Allah says again, When waves engulf them in the sea like canopies, they call upon Allah. Again, full-heartedly in their faith solely to Him. But when He delivers them safely to the land, some of them become lukewarm, meaning they start to not really stick to their promise and their deal that they made with Allah in the beginning. None denies our sign except those who are ungrateful and those who don't want to follow the truth. Brothers and sisters, 
Each and every one of us has been through some hardship in life. And we need to call upon Allah. So Allah invites us. In the Quran, in chapter 40, verse 60, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ Allah says, Your Lord said, Pray to me, make dua to me, call upon me, and I will accept your prayers. Surely those who are too proud to worship me shall enter hell utterly abased. Let's go through this verse a little bit. Please bear with me and stay with me, inshallah. The first thing that we notice about this particular verse, the first thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to make dua, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in dua. And the second thing we notice is that he mentions ibadah, which means worship. The two things, dua and ibadah, calling to Allah and worshiping Him are exactly the same thing. Some people, they say dua means just to call upon Allah for what I need. No, 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 no. You need to understand. Everything you do of worship, your salah, your fasting, your zakah, your sadaqah, helping another person, visiting a sick person, guiding another person, advising another person, being there to help someone, bringing a smile to another person, all these good deeds, all these good deeds of worship, they are all called dua. Your salat, from the moment you say Allahu Akbar to the moment you say Salaamu Alaikum, it is all called what? Dua. Because the word dua means ibadah. And ibadah means dua. Did, did you all get that? It's very important. You have to get that before I can go on. Worship is supplication. And supplication is worship. What does that mean? It means that every time you worship Allah, any good deed you do for His sake, while you are not lifting your hands up like this and saying, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, the fact that you are doing an act of worship itself is a request from Allah for something. And Allah rewards you all the time. That's why when you do your salat and you finish, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you more. We just don't see it all the time. When you do a good deed, don't you feel something changing in your heart? When you look after an orphan, don't you feel something changing in your heart? When you've advised someone or you were there for them and you feel and they come up to you and say, Wallahi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you to me and my life changed. Or I was about to do this and you came to me and this changed. How do you feel? Because an act of worship changes something inside you and gives you a paradise in your heart that nobody has. So therefore, brothers and sisters, there's two types of dua. The dua of request, which all of us know about. It's when you say, oh Allah, I'm poor, give me. Oh Allah, I'm sick, cure me. Oh Allah, have mercy on my parents. Oh Allah, I'm lost, guide me. Oh Allah, protect me. All this is called the requesting dua. The second type of dua is what? What is it? You guys are not listening. What's the second type of dua? Worshipping Allah. Worshipping is called dua. There's a reason why I'm saying that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the hadith is in Tirmidhi, ad-du'a'u huwa mukhu al-ibadah. Prayer or dua is the marrow. The marrow is the marrow of the bone. It's the heart of worship. Dua is the heart of worship. Because worship is how you connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm sure you have husbands and wives here. You have parents and children here. You have siblings over here. You have friends. Some of you have pets. You have pets at home. I'm sure that you love someone or something. And I'm sure that your connection with that someone or something is very special. If it's not special, there is no attachment really. Can you imagine you say, they say to you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But they're not actually fulfilling anything about the love. They're not really doing anything to show you the love. You'll say, well, you're a hypocrite. This is hypocrisy. If you say to somebody, I love you, but you show no love towards us, there's nothing that you're doing. The love is not real. Isn't that correct? And you feel that cold, the relationship is cold. 
If, you, if there's a friend of yours that you really love and you tell them you're my best friend or whatever, but you don't call them and they don't call you and you don't spend time together, suddenly your hearts kind of drift apart. You don't remember each other that much. Same with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you don't have a special type of connection that you talk to Him, you're going to be forgetful. Some people, they say, oh, I love Allah and I'm always loving Him and I'm there and I'm that and I'm this and I'm that and if, you know, I'll, I'll go out and always defend Islam. But that's not enough, brothers and sisters. If you don't have regular contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, regular talking on a daily basis, you are never going to feel that connection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. Ever. Brothers and sisters, the second thing we take out of this verse is the following. That Allah loves it when we supplicate to Him. He loves it whenever we supplicate to Him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Ask of Allah His bounty. Ask Him, O oh my Lord, give me from your bounty. O oh Allah, provide me from your blessings. O oh Allah, let me enjoy your blessings. Nothing wrong with that. Because Allah likes that He should be asked. You know what? Someone told me a very stupid question. They, they asked me a stupid question. Actually, it wasn't even a question. It was a statement. They come up and they go, Hmm, why would God need you to ask Him? This sounds like a narcissistic person, a controlling person. They always want you to come back to them, to feel that you are in need of them. SubhanAllah, this is kufr. This is disbelief and blasphemy. Twisted ideologies. And I'm sure they're not Muslims who said that, but that did come to me. Brothers and sisters, don't ever think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that way. I'll tell you why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He loves it for you to ask Him and supplicate to Him. Number one, to make you feel His presence with you. That's the first thing. When you call upon Allah for a need, it means that you feel His presence with you. Allah doesn't need anything. He doesn't need you to call upon Him. What are you going to bring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? For you to feel His presence that He is with you. That's number one. Number two, you call upon Allah and Allah loves it because He wants to make you know that He is always listening. You know, you love your parents when your parents listen. Always young people, they say to me, my mom and dad just they don't listen. So I go and do my own thing. They're the last people that I'll tell that I've got a girlfriend. Why? Or a boyfriend or someone that I love. Because they don't, they've never listened. What are they going to tell me? And I'm not saying that this justifies you to go and do that haram, brothers and sisters. Don't you ever do that. I pr promise you, when you get married, you're going to have all sorts of problems. Trust issues. The person that you marry, if you've been out together a lot, then they're probably going to say every time, if a girl goes past, a woman goes past, and you look at her, she's going to say, well, you looked at me when it was all haram. How do I know that you fear Allah now? And then he will say to her, well, you went out with me as well. How can I trust you? I've seen a lot of this happen. Start everything halal and watch how, inshallah, your relationships will be pure, inshallah ta'ala. But anyway, coming back to the story. Number three, it shows that he cares and loves you because he wants you to connect with him and ask him because he loves to give you. He loves to look after you. Number four, to make you feel independent of people. We always, com we always complain about how we can't trust everyone, how everybody betrays us, even the closest of people, even the people who help you a lot. There comes a point where they just can't help you. Isn't that right? They let you down. They fail you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, if the whole world fails you and turns their back on them, always know that I am always here for you and you are independent. You don't have to please anybody. So long as you are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are free and you are independent. And every single individual in this audience and around the world can be special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not need anybody. All you have to say is, Hasbi Allah wa ni'ma al-wakeel. We hear the Palestinian brothers and sisters in Gaza every time, no matter how many members of their family die under the rubbles, what are they saying? What do you hear them saying? What do you hear them saying? Allah wa ni'mal wakil. We don't need anybody. We have Allah. Ma'an Allah, they say. This is what we want. This is true victory, brothers and sisters. This is true victory. This is what's killing their enemies. How are they still so victorious and free? Because it's inside. They've got Allah. Just like Ibrahim was thrown in the fire, he said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. He doesn't need anybody. And Allah says, I'm here for you. Brothers and sisters, it is also human natural inclination to turn to a caregiver, as I said before, and Allah is omnipotent, omnipresent. He's present always with you, all powerful, and He gives you a sense of security and hope. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you to call upon Him. He wants you to feel it, He wants you to grow, He wants you to feel amazing. Brothers and sisters, so dua 
and worship is attachment and relationship with your caregiver and your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Next, brothers and sisters, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, when you ask and call to Allah, make dua about everything, everything. Listen to this. The hadith is in Tirmidhi. He said, each one of you should ask his every need of Allah. So much so that even if his shoelace breaks, he should pray to Allah about it. It's an authentic hadith. How do you pray to Allah if your shoelace breaks? Or if you do up your shoelace? You can say this. You can say, Bismillah. When you wear your shoes, you can say, Oh Allah, bring about, good, bring about goodness for me by wearing these shoes. Talk to Allah and say this stuff. This stuff is not just affirmation. This stuff really makes you connected to the true God, Allah, and it makes your day change. Try it. Try it every morning. Tomorrow morning, put your shoes on, do your shoelaces up, and say, Bismillah, oh Allah, make these shoes a pathway for goodness for my day today. Make me walk to the best of places that benefit me. Try it tomorrow. I dare you to try it tomorrow. Come on. Try it tomorrow. And inshallah, you'll see something change about your day. My brothers and sisters, another thing we understand from this verse, Allah says, I will respond to you. Now, this is the biggest problem people have. It's a big misunderstanding. A lot of people say, I've asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I've made dua, why isn't the response coming? Where is it? And then they give up. Here's the thing, brothers and sisters, listen very carefully. It's a very important lesson. We human beings, we don't know everything. Do you agree? Do I know what's going to happen tomorrow? Do I know what's going to happen tonight? I don't know. I didn't even choose to be born here. Who am I? Where am I going? I don't, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So when I make dua, I'm expecting something specific from Allah at a specific time in a specific way. That's the majority of people, they're doing it. I remember one person, uh, they were going through grief. So they came to me for a bit of help. And they did the typical stuff. You know, they, they went and made dua. They isolated themselves from people. They left their job. And then they're making dua night and day, night and day, crying and crying and crying. And then they said to me, it's getting worse. Why isn't Allah giving me help? And I said to them, it's because you are focusing on one particular expectation. You are focusing on God giving you something specific and that is relief. I said, you are over exhausting yourself. Because you're thinking about it a lot, you're making it worse. You have to get out of it and continue. Get out, make your dua and then move. You got to do your part. And don't expect something specific at a specific time. Allah knows and say, Allah will give it to me exactly when I need it. Listen to this beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu He said, Pray to Allah with the certainty that He will answer your dua. That's the first condition. When you make dua, have certainty that Allah is going to respond to you. Number two, don't be hasty. Don't hurry up the dua. Rather, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the servant's, pray, the, the servant's prayer is granted provided that he does not pray for a sin, you can't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something sinful. And number two, for severing connections with the kindred. So to say, oh Allah, uh, disunite between so and so and so and so. Oh Allah, disconnect my parents from me. Disconnect my children from me. Disconnect my cousin from me. No, 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 no. That's not how you should make your dua. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ then said, so long as you don't ask for something sinful or cutting off of ties, Unless you say somebody is really harming you in your family, you say, oh Allah, protect me from this particular person in my family who's harming me. That's a different story. But I'm talking about, you know, sometimes, like some, some young people, they say to me that, um, sir or sheikh, some of my students, they say, my mother made a dua against me and I didn't even do anything. Will her dua be accepted? So what did she say? She said, I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cuts you off out of my life. I said, inshallah, that dua is not going to be accepted. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, so long as you do not make a dua of severing ties. Sometimes I heard another person came up to me and says, my dad doesn't like the woman I married. 
So he made a dua for us to separate. I said, inshallah, his dua is not going to be accepted. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, so long as you do not make a dua for severing ties. They said, but they're my parents and Allah said that he accepts all their dua. Yes, accepts the dua when you wrong them, not when they wrong you. And your dua against someone else with injustice, like if you say, oh Allah, do such and such to so and so, and they don't deserve it, your dua is not going to be accepted. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is adil, he's just, and he will not respond to injustice. Next, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, so long as you are not hasty. O Messenger of Allah, they said, what does hasty mean? And he said, being hasty is that a person says, I have prayed so much again and again, but my dua is not being answered. Then he becomes tired and gives up their dua. Which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was probably about to accept it, about to give you what you want, and then you just gave up. The second thing we know here, that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Whenever a Muslim prays, unless it be a prayer for a sin or for severing relationships with a kindred, Allah grants it in one way or one of three ways. Number one, either his dua is granted in this very world. You get what you want in this world. Or it is preserved for rewarding him or her in the hereafter. Or a disaster of some degree is prevented from befalling him or her. This is how the companions and the prophets used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, Oh Allah, give me what is best for me. And you are the most merciful. Ayyub alayhi salam did not say, Oh Allah, cure me when he got sick. The prophet Ayyub said, Masaniya durru wa anta arhamur Oh Allah, harm has touched me and you are the most merciful. Meaning, we never attribute anything negative to Allah. Harm does not come from Allah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows harm to come to you, it has to be some benefit in it. But pure evil, Allah never, never decrees pure evil on anybody. So that's why Ayyub said, oh Allah, evil has touched me. It is said that his wife started to get affected. The shaitan came and started to whisper to her. So he said, oh Allah, harm has affected me. And you are the most merciful, meaning do whatever it is under your mercy that is best for me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only do what is merciful to you. This is the way we ask Allah. The fourth thing we, we understand from this verse is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who disdain my worship shall enter hell utterly abased. You know what that means? It doesn't mean that if you don't make dua, you're going to go to hellfire. What it means, remember what I told you, dua is ibadah, and ibadah is dua. It means people who give up on Allah, they don't worship Allah, they turn their backs on Allah, it means they're ungrateful to Allah, it means they don't acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider, the maintainer, the powerful. That means you turn to, to something else for help. These people have given up on Allah. They will not receive what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for them. One of my friends once said to me, you know, worshipping another god or making dua to another god or to something else other than Allah and then expecting the reward from Allah is like working for Hyundai and expecting Audi to pay you. It's not going to work. Can you work for a company and expect another company to pay you? No, you've got to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have a two-way communication and connection. My brothers and sisters, something very important. We notice in this verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he will respond. Some person might ask the question, hold on a minute, hold on. If Allah has already written everything for me and everything's already going to happen and my fate and my destiny is already written, what's the point of making dua? If I make dua, whatever God has written for me is still going to happen, so what's the point? Or some people, they say, hold on, why would Allah say to me, ask dua when he's already written what's going to happen, so he's already, you know, he has to stick to his word that he wrote this. This is what people have asked me, what billah. The answer to that, brothers and sisters, is here. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of qadr. He is in control of destiny and fate. And there are certain destinies of fate that can never change. For example, if you say, oh Allah, return me back to my mother's womb and make me a boy instead of a girl. Or make me a girl instead of a boy. Oh Allah, return me back and give me different parents. Oh Allah, make me fly. No, no. There are certain things that cannot change. But there are certain things that are connected to your dua. Allah has left every single one of us in this world, even the non-Muslims, everybody. There are certain things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholds and he'll change them only if you do something. And if you don't do that something, then the original decision will be given to you. Example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever likes to have a longer life and more blessings and wealth in life, then be good to your parents and connect your ties. 
Because there's happiness when your family is together, inshallah, if you can. The Prophet ﷺ gave us several other examples. He said, Nothing can avert destiny but the prayer. لا يغير القدر إلا الدعاء. Bad destiny. Bad things that people don't like. Nothing can change it except dua. But you might be saying, Hold on a minute. I thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one that does all the qadr. How could my dua change? Well, who are you calling to? You are calling to the one who owns the qadr. So the one who made the qadr, you're calling him to change that qadr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you, I have left some of the qadr to be changed based on your dua. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa wants to give you importance. He wants to work with you. So that when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you change or you do something good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you by changing the qadr and saying to the angels, I have now made a decision for this person in another way. Wallahi al-Azim. And finally, brothers and sisters, here are some ways to make dua. Number one, in your sujood, when you are in salat in sujood, after your prayers, sit down and make dua. In the nights, Get up and make dua while doing a good deed. You're doing a good deed, make dua like what Ibrahim and Ismail did. When Ibrahim and Ismail were building the Kaaba, they would make dua as they're building it. So as you're doing a good deed, make dua and the dua will inshallah be more likely to be accepted. In any language you like, it doesn't have to be in Arabic. You can make your dua. Some people say to me, but in my salat, do I have to make dua in Arabic? I say to you, the scholars said that in the compulsory prayer, stick to the Arabic ones that you've learned from the Prophet Sallallahu and in your sunnah and nafil prayers, you can do your dua in English. And that is the correct opinion, inshallah. Otherwise, you can make your dua in any language you want. In fact, the dua has to come out from your own heart. So even if you make a dua in the way that you know, like you might be sitting there and saying, Oh Allah, I don't know what it is, but there's something I'm not feeling right about this here. Allah, I don't know what to ask for, but just whatever is good within your mercy. That's it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what you need. Another thing is by mentioning your past good deeds. Some people, they say to me, isn't that blackmail? I couldn't believe that question. I said a story about three men who were stuck in a cave and one of them, he said, uh, they got together and they said, let's all take a corner and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by mentioning some of our good deeds that we've done in the past and maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will relieve us from this cave. And then the first man, he said, Ya Rabb, I had uh, parents who I loved and I used to serve them a lot. And then one day they asked for some water. I went and got them water. I came home and I found them asleep, Ya Rabb. So I stayed next to them, waiting for them to wake up any minute just to give them that water. I didn't want to also disturb them. And they didn't wake up until Fajr. Oh my Lord, then I gave them the water. Oh Allah, if you know that I did this for your sake and only to please you and out of love for my parents, then save us from this cave. And the rock moved only a little bit. The second person, he said, Oh Allah, I had a cousin and she was very pretty and very gorgeous. And I tempted for her. He says, one day I offered her money and I said, I'll give you money if you will do haram with me. And she said, no. Then she, then she became destitute, destitute at one point. And then I offered her again. And then she said, okay, you give me the money because I'm so much in need. It's a matter of life and death. And then he said, when I had power over her and I was about to do the haram with her, she reminded me. She said, fear Allah, my cousin. And if you want to take me, then take it in the halal. He said, I feared Allah and this woke me up. It hit me. I went away and I let her keep the jewelry. Oh Allah, if you know for your sake, I went against and withheld my temptation for your sake, save us from this cave. So the rock moved only a little bit, but well, not enough. The third person, he said, oh Allah, I used to have a business and I had investors in, in crops. And after everyone invested, the, the crops came out and I gave them profit. One of them didn't take his profit on that day. He went and about a year later, he came back and then he wanted his profit. I gave him a little bit of profit. So he wanted his profit and then I said to him, you know what, your profit stayed with me and it made one year's profit extra. So you deserve everything you see in front of you. That all came from your investment. He said, you're joking. He said, wallahi, it's yours. This is our contract. And he took everything. He said, Ya Rabbi, if you know that I fulfilled my promise and my contract for your sake, save us from this cave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them. If you have good deeds and you remember them, mention them to Allah. Someone said to me, is this blackmail? You're mentioning your, your, your good deeds with Allah. Give me this for that. No. No, subhanallah, worship is dua and dua is worship. So what you did over there is actually worship. All you're doing is, oh my Lord, that worship that I did for you, I'd like to use it now. And I'm in desperate need. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you that as a gift. He says, I will let you use even the worship that you did and I will not take away your deeds at all. This is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and out of his mercy. And finally, brothers and sisters, this is beautiful. Did you know that the angels also can make dua for you? I'm going to give you five ways to get the angels to make dua for you. Number one. Number one. 
when you repent to Allah, making tawbah, you're doing something wrong and you decide to change your life. This is the best dua. The angels, they say, the angels that bear the throne and those that are around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the Lord, and praise Him, they believe in Him and ask forgiveness for the believers, saying, O oh, our Lord, you encompass everything with your mercy and knowledge, so forgive those that repent and follow your path and guard them against the chastisement of hellfire. Our Lord, admit them to the everlasting gardens you have promised them, and those of their fathers and spouses and progeny that were righteous, surely you alone are most mighty, most wise, and guard them against all ills. He whom you guard against ills on that day, to him you have surely been most merciful. This is the great triumph. All this dua the angel makes for you when you repent to Allah. Number two, checking in on your sick or ill brother or sister when they are in need or they need help. The Prophet ﷺ said that 70,000 angels pray for this person from morning until sunset if they checked on that sick person or the person in need in the morning. And they make dua for you, 70,000 from sunset until fajr if you checked on that person at sunset. 70,000 angels. The hadith is in Tirmidhi and Ahmad. Number three, while sitting briefly after you pray and you don't talk to anyone, so long as you're sitting there, let's say five minutes, the angels make dua for you to forgive you while you're sitting there. And number four, when you give charity. And number five, please listen to this and this is the conclusion. If you want the, the angels to make dua for you, number five, you make dua for your believing brothers and sisters around the world. The Prophet wasallam said in Sahih Muslim and others, making dua for your brothers and sisters in their absence, not in their face, because you don't want anything from them. In their absence is an accepted dua. Standing at that person's head is a delegated angel specifically for you. Every time the person makes dua for their brother or sister in their absence, the angel says, Ameen, and for you is the same, and for you is the same. So brothers and sisters, make dua for your family, make dua for your brothers and sisters, for every believer around the world, two billion Muslims, two billion duas from that one angel. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, my brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our brothers and sisters in Gaza, in Palestine. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and protect our brothers and sisters all around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on, the, on their martyrs and make their children waiting for them at the fountains and the doors of Jannah. Inni uhibbukum fillah. I love you for the sake of Allah. Make dua for us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.